Well, good morning, Bedford Acres. How are all y'all this morning? Y'all doing good? Awesome. So before we go into a time of worship, I just wanted to share um, my daily devotion today. I really thought it fit with Battle Belongs. So it says, strength of his presence. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. And that is 1 Chronicles 16, 11. So it reads, our lives demand strength. There are many situations that we find ourselves in that test what we're made of. We do our best to be strong and to meet each challenge head on, but we consistently come up short. What we often fail to recognize is that it's only in our weakness that the perfect strength of God can be shown. We have a God who fights for us, a God who bends down his ear to our cry and who leads his strength for the battle. When we seek to dwell in the place of his presence daily, we will find his strength in our hearts and his power in our spirits. So I just wanted to encourage you guys with that this morning. So let's go to prayer before we begin worship. Dear Jesus, thank you just so very much for being in your house again on this great Sunday where we get to lift up your name, the almighty name, the king of kings. You are just sitting on your throne um, waiting to hear us worship and celebrate you and what a gift that is as a congregation that we can freely do this each week and God we just can't wait to sing your praises so thank you for allowing us to be here this Sunday amen Nothing can stand against the power 
morning and welcome to Bedford Acres Christian Church. We're really glad you're here today. Uh, we just want to say welcome if it's your first time with us. And, and if you're a regular folk, we're glad to see you too. Uh, my name is uh, Carl Willoughby and I get to work with the students here at Bedford Acres. And so if I can uh, help you in any way, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, please fill out the connect cards in front of you. I'm going to put my glasses on now. That'll be good. Um, Please put your name on those connect cards there in front of you um, use, or use the church center app to check in and let us know how things are going, what's going on. Um, please silence your cell phones, uh, not to scare you. <laughs> I'm scared already. Um, but Christmas is just around the corner. Yeah, it's Jesus's birthday. What are we scared of? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, the youth, we are collecting uh, clothing and supplies for blessing bags to be distributed on, s on Sunday, December 15th to the homeless in downtown Lexington. So please uh, see myself, see Jill Hurt about, you know, things, coats, hats, and, and we're going to be doing um, some giving baskets as well. Um, Ashley Osborne is also helping with that so you could see her. A youth Christmas party on December 11th at uh, here and we will uh, be here doing it at about six o'clock we'll do a little caroling really excited about that if you've ever heard mason mcclure carol um it's really exciting save the dates turkeys hams too our annual all church thanksgiving dinner will be here in the fellowship hall sunday november 24th at five o'clock the church will provide turkey and ham while you are asked to bring sides and desserts we need help cooking the meat. Please check out our sign-up sheets in the church lobby. So that's out there. Um, this weekend, we do have a, a church coming in, uh, some youth coming in to stay in our church. Um, so just pray for them. They're coming in for a missions conference. And so uh, it's actually our former pastor Mitchell's church from Indiana. It's their youth minister and his kids. So just uh, pray that they have a good experience here with us. Um, also, we're going to the rodeo. Thank you. We'll be taking a crew to the rodeo, and we're going to be leaving here about 3.30 on Saturday. If you have not paid, please do so. Please do so. Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Program. You have one week left to grab or more, uh, a few empty boxes out in the lobby. Fill them. They need to be back here next Sunday. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Now, we have uh, a lot of folks that we need to be continued praying for, uh, Miss Vivian, and we have some folks that are very sick, and we have some people that are having eye surgery and people who have been diagnosed with cancer, and uh, we have a lot uh, uh, to pray for, and um, I'm going to say a prayer just in a second, but I did want to tell you about a less, uh, a less exciting, scary, th put this on your prayer list, but don't make it a major concern, and I'm sorry. I am going to embarrass Bobby Rankin, but Bobby and I have been, been friends for a long, long time, and um, he called me this week, and he said, well, you know, he said, I, I want you to pray about something, and he's dead serious, and I said, okay, he said, now, you know who, who I'm related to, and I said, oh, I saw it in the news, and he said, yeah, my Uncle Bruce is probably going to kill those boys, and I said, what are you talking about now? I know the big news of this week was the Auburn basketball team getting in trouble on the airplane. If you didn't see that, they were playing around on the airplane, and they had to turn the airplane around and let them off. Very exciting. Proud moment for the SEC. Um, and Miss Bruce Pearl is Bobby's uncle, if you don't know. And so he, um, he, he was crying, and he's met those boys. You've met those boys down there. And he likes this Auburn team. They're young and they're fun. But he is concerned. We have all seen Bruce Pearl at UK and everywhere else kind of lose his stuff. And he named a kid. I don't remember the kid, Bobby. I'm sorry. But he thought specifically Bruce might strangle him to death. So if you could add that to your prayer list. Um, he was very, he's, he's smiling now, but he was crying just a couple days ago. So uh, if, we could, if we could take care of that too. Pray for Bruce Pearl that he doesn't go to jail. Okay, let's pray for some more serious stuff real quick. Father God, we just ask that you be with this uh, church. God, we've got a, 
we've got some cancers going on, we've got eye surgeries, we've got, we've got heart issues, we've just got a lot. And Lord, we just ask that you um, reach down to comfort, divine healing. We ask for the doctors and nurses that you have given the ability to, to be on their best that day. God, we just love you and we just trust you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. You guys can stand up and hug and welcome each other.
So whenever um, I was asked to do communion, uh, I went back to what the word communion meant. I was wondering, why do we do communion? So communion, obviously coming from the word commune, commune means to have an intimate conversation between friends. Communion, a community. We do communion as a family, as friends, in remembrance of Jesus. So a while ago at my school, it's a Christian school, private Christian school, uh, they had chapel and they offered communion cups. And I asked one of my friends why he didn't take one. He said, well, my dad says we're only supposed to take communion in the church. I said back to him, but we are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. He's like, no, that's not what I mean. What do you mean? American culture says the church is just a building. Some Christians go to every Sunday. They just take communion, talk about the Bible, and then they just go back to work for the rest of the week. That's not what the church is. I go back to the first communion whenever I think of this. Where did Jesus go when he had communion? He didn't go to a mega church. He didn't go to Bedford Acres. He went to some random guy's house with his disciples. Just having a good time. First Corinthians 11. 27 through 29 says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What this is saying is we need to be careful. Jesus is inviting us to partake in communion. But if we're not putting his trust, if we're not doing his will, if we're not a part of his family, a part of the church, part of that community, communion, then we're doing it in vain. We're just bringing judgment upon ourselves. Paul's warning us, don't do communion in vain. Don't do it just because everybody else in the church is doing it just because some people in a building that go there every Sunday are doing it. I remember my history teacher saying that the hard truth is that not everybody's a child of God. Well, we say, well, everybody's a child of God. I mean, we just try to get, we just try to do our best in this world, you know. But that doesn't make you a child of God. To be a child of God is to do the Lord's will. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 47 through 50, Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You're not a child of God. You're not a part of his family unless you're doing the will of the Father. You can't be a part of the community unless you're part of the family of the Father. So whenever you take this communion, if you know you're not a part of his family, just set that cup down because you're just bringing judgment upon yourself. You're doing it in vain. You need to do the will of the Father. You need to take the plank out of your own eye before you start being a part of his family. But the thing I love about this is Jesus is inviting everyone. Whenever he came down, people thought, well, the Messiah is just for the Jews. But Jesus fed the 5,000, the 4,000, turned water into wine. This is all foreshadowing of his, his sacrifice later after. He multiplied bread for the Jews and the Gentiles. He turned water into wine for all those people in the banquet, the best wine. He's foreshadowing the events later on saying, hey, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be letting everybody into my house. You just have to accept the bread that I'm giving you. You have to just accept the wine that I'm giving you. He 
He's waiting for you with open arms. You just got to say, hey, I accept that. I accept the bread. I accept the wine. And I want to be a part of your family. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Whenever you're a part of his family, you'll be lifted up. You'll be on a firm foundation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you invite us to be a part of your family, your perfect and holy family. I just pray that every single day we're reminded that you want everybody to be a part of your family, and that all we have to do is accept that. I pray that as we take this communion, we're just reminded of your bread and your blood. that we partake of it, remembering that all are welcome, and that when we're believers, we are a part of that body, that community. It's your name, Christ. Amen. Please play with me with um, tithes and offerings. Jesus, thank you for all that you've given us. Um, I pray that you just bless the, the stuff that we're giving back that we don't deserve, that you graciously, graciously have given us. And I pray that this money will further your kingdom. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
much for this beautiful time of worship. Thank you for letting us surrender it all and proclaim you boldly. Thank you, God, for lifting up a praise for the great defender that you are. Did you get your new boot, Carla? Is that your new boot? Yes, it is. That is awesome. Thank you. So I just decided that if I have to wear this, it's going to be all the all that. And that fits you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a great day so far. If anybody uh, is afraid of what the young people of our church are going to be doing in the next generation, I think uh, we don't have a whole lot to worry about if we keep seeing young people like we saw this morning. Amen. And you know, today's the day we remember some other young people that uh, maybe not as young as they used to be. How many of you were young people maybe 18, 19 years old, and you took an oath to defend this country, would you stand? Some of you did. If you're a vet, that means if you're a veteran, would you stand? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for two things. Number one, thank you that we can recognize you on Veterans Day and we don't have to only recognize you on Memorial Day. Thank you for coming home. And thank you for keeping a, us safe here. Uh, we all know, as a country, we're a lot. <laughs> this country is a lot. Uh, I remember the movie, uh, The American President, I think it was. And uh, the guy that was the president talked about how that... Uh, Democracy in this country is not easy. <laughs> it's hard. It's a high-level class. It really is. And uh, we need to be praying for our country, pray for our leaders, pray for fellow citizens. For some people, this past week was all kinds of excitement. For some, it was, you know, not exciting at all. It was scary for some. And I think if it had been flipped, it would have been flipped evenly, probably. But the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders, Pray that God blesses them, that they get a heart for him. And we need to be doing that. And uh, even more so when we consider Veterans Day, all those that have fought and many died to give us the freedom to choose. Whether you think we choose poorly or wisely, we still have the choice. And that is a lot too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this nation we live in. Thank you for the freedoms that we have, even though sometimes we act like we don't appreciate them as much as we should. Certainly, Lord, we thank you for those that were among us today that stood, and for those many, many more who aren't here to stand, that have put on the colors, that have protected us, that have swore that sacred oath to defend us from enemies abroad and domestic. Help us, Lord, to be a nation that honors you. Be with those that are still in office and those that will be taken office. Draw them to you. Lord, there's so much uh, in our country that's about me and not us. Free us from that. Help us to do our part, to be faithful, to pray for our leaders. Again, we thank you for those that have served and certainly for those who have paid the ultimate price. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, John the Apostle writes these words. He said, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, 
we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. We've been talking about uh, PlayStation, and, and we kind of use the backdrop of a, of a gaming system. I think most of you have been here for most of that. If this is your first Sunday in this series, it may sound a little weird. I'm talking about PlayStation instead of PlayStation. But at this point in the series, we've got the PlayStation, we got it plugged in, and now it's just, what we're going to talk about today is what happens when it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. <laughs> what happens when you've, you've plugged everything in, the TV's on, and it's like something is wrong. So what happens? What do you do? Well, there's two things you can do. You can pull out the instructions, and it'll have a section that's called troubleshooting. That's the hard way. The easy way is to call your neighbor who's got a middle schooler or an elementary kid and come over and fix it for you, right? That's kind of like my phone. If my phone starts acting up, I, I give it to Zeke. You know, when Lane was here, I give it to Lane. These young guys, they know all this stuff. I know nothing about it. I know I pick up the phone, I'm supposed to call, and somebody's supposed to be able to talk to me on the other end. And if it doesn't work, my troubleshooting skills are to call somebody. Maybe that's the way it is with the PlayStation. But what about when it's not the PlayStation? What about it's the pray station? It's your prayer life. Preacher tells you you're supposed to pray. The Bible says you're supposed to pray. Everybody who's a believer knows, yes, you're supposed to pray. But what happens when I pray and it seems like something's wrong? You ever prayed and it felt like it just bounced off the ceiling and came back down? You ever pray and, and you know you should do it and you don't feel like doing it? What do you do? Well, there are some troubleshooting guides. And, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks. Now, before we even dive into that, I, I want to suggest there's an underlying problem for some people. Why? Simply why their prayers don't work. Because they don't think they will. There's a lot of people that think, you know, God might answer somebody else's prayer. Certainly, he'll answer the preacher's prayer because the preacher, everybody knows, is, is holier than anybody else, right? That's not true, by the way. The preacher never gets angry at anybody. No, that's not true. The preacher's never tempted like anybody else. That's a lie. You know, oh, wait, mate, maybe, maybe the elders, their prayers are always answered. Is that right? You know, you guys never have any trouble with prayer, do you? None of your elders ever have any that? Yeah, they do. We're people. So, you know, but some people have this mindset, and it's an error, that God answers some people's prayers, but he's just never going to get around to answering mine. Because God cares for more people than he does for me. He cares for those people, but not me. So that is an underlying false reality. So let's get that out of the way. Now, there's also the misunderstanding of how does God answer prayers. Now, most people would recognize that, you've heard this before, there's three ways God can answer prayer, right? He can say yes, he can say no, or he can say wait, right? What about the fourth one? Is there a fourth one? Yeah, there is. That's the one where he doesn't say anything. He does not respond. Now, everybody in here, if you've ever prayed, you've, you've probably experienced all three of these, the first three. You've prayed, and it seems like God said, yes, yes, we like that one. That's the easy one to take, right? What about the second one? God, God clearly says no, but it's clear he said no. How do we handle that one? It's not as easy as yes, but certainly I think most of us as believers understand that God is perfect. He's got this perfect mindset. He knows better we. And if he clearly says no, okay, I may not like it right now, but I can live with it because I know God's God. The wait is probably harder than the other two because we know God's time is not my time, and my time is pretty much I wanted it yesterday. Same as yours, right? The last one, though, the woman don't talk about a whole lot is when it just seems like God didn't answer at all. So is it possible that we're praying and God isn't answering at all? Uh, I don't like the answer. You probably won't like it either. Yes, it's true. Sometimes God chooses not to answer. That's where the troubleshooting guide comes in. That's where you start pulling out the manual and say, how come this ain't working? Let's look at the passage again. 
1 John chapter 3, this time it says, pay attention, with the idea that he may not answer. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Warren Rearsby said like this, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. So if your heart is condemning you, if you are not obeying his commands, if you're not doing what pleases him, that's a pretty good indicator of why he's just not answering. So what are some of the heart issues that any of us can have that could keep God from answering? Now, this is, this is something in here for everybody today. You know, uh, none of you want any of this, but we all can appreciate it because it looks like us too many times. Where the troubleshooting begins, what troubleshooting guide for this game, this prayer game, if you will, what are, what are the issues? And you know, when you go to a troubleshooting guide, what's it do? It usually asks a series of questions, doesn't it? Have you done this? Have you, have you tried this? Have you plugged it in? You know, it, it, it's a series of questions. And if you've ever, have you ever called tech support? It's really frustrating when you get to the third or fourth time because they've got a metric they have to go through. You understand that, right? You know, did you try this? Did you try this? Well, you tried all these things. It still didn't work. So what do you do? You call them again and you get somebody else. And what do they do? You tell them, oh, I've tried this. Before we start, I've done this and this. What do they do? They still ask you the same questions. Okay, I'm going to tell you. We're going to ask some questions. They're in your notes. Write them down because if you're like me, you're a meathead sometimes, and you need to be asked the same questions multiple times because sometimes we can be slow learners. At least I can be. First question is, prayer's not working. Are there issues of anger and wrath that I need to deal with? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 said, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. That's awesome, right? Whoa. Without anger or disputing. The New American Standard in the same passage says it like this. Therefore, I want men everywhere, every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath or dissension. Oh, we like that part of, oh, I want to lift up holy hands in prayer. But I'm not supposed to be angry at people. I'm not supposed to be wrathful. I'm not supposed to be. So what do those words mean anyway? Well, anger, by definition, means a strong feeling of displeasure and belligerence aroused by a wrong. Someone did something to you, and you are unhappy about it. You're belligerent about it. Wrath is vengeance or punishment as the consequence of anger. Someone has done something, now you're anger, and you're hanging on to it, and now you say, oh, it's Sunday, I'm supposed to go pray, or I've got this issue, I'm supposed to go pray, and you pray, and nothing. And God is saying, he doesn't say quit praying, he says, I want men to pray. You know, a matter of fact, he says, with holy, lifting holy hands, that's a, a reverence, that's worship, I want you to do it like that. But leave the anger and all that nonsense out of it. <laughs> How many... Don't raise your hands. This could be embarrassing. How many of you had a big fight on the way to church or getting ready for church? How many songs you got to sing before you oh, let that go? Huh, I'm there. I love my wife to death. I'm so glad she's here today because first time she's been here, yeah, that's awesome. For years, and now part of it's my fault, a little bit. When we were younger, we had little kids. We had little kids in the house and you know, I always had to be at church early, and we're totally different animals. I mean, I, if I'm not half hour early, I feel like I'm late. She's on Melody Standard Time, okay? So we figured out a long time ago, it was just easier for us to drive separate. <laughs> because it's hard to preach and be happy every Sunday after we've had a big fight. You know, and I'm weird. It's me. I'll, I'll own it. If, 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 if I've got to be here at 1030, I'm, I'm back dating. Okay, I know good and well. For me to be here at 1030 for something, I'm going to be here at 10. And I'm going to leave the house early enough so I can be here at 10. And I've got this internal clock that as soon as this one second passed, when I need to be walking out the door, I'm picking a fight. Because <laughs> I'm a meathead. It's me. Okay, but we've gotten a lot better. Kids have grown up, got out of the house. She's adjusted to my schedule. I've let up. A, have I improved a little, honey? You know, as they say in Spanish, poquita. <laughs> Very little. 
But bottom line, the text is saying, you cannot, I cannot lift up holy hands while I'm harboring anger and wrath. Now, that's a little thing, okay? But when you're waking up in the middle of the night and somebody's face is right there because you're angry and you're gritting your teeth all night because you haven't forgiven, you haven't let it go, it's going to be impossible for you to pray in a way that God's going to respond. The Bible doesn't say anger's wrong. I mean, I know people that'll say, oh, you're a preacher, you're a Christian, you're not allowed to be angry. That's not true. But Ephesians it does say something, though. In Ephesians 4.26, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. How many of you have ever gone to bed angry? Let the sun go down while you're angry. Sometimes, night after night after night, still angry. The Bible says by doing that, you give the devil a foothold. Why would we do that? There are situations where anger is legitimate. But it's not legitimate to hang on to that anger because we were not willing to deal with it or let it go. If you're not willing to go to that person and deal with it, then according to Scripture, you need to be willing to let it go. Now, don't break into that song from Frozen, okay? So what's the problem with anger anyway? I mean, there's, there's legitimate reasons that anger can be a problem. Number one, angry destroys unity. Again, Ephesians 4.31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander among, uh, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Why in the world do you tack that last part on there? Because it eliminates the wiggle room. <laughs> he doesn't just say forgive other people. He said forgive them just like Christ forgave you. See, in, in the flesh, I can justify not forgiving somebody. You know, Carla was mean to me. Of course I'm not responsible, you know, because she did this first, right? I can't say that about God. <laughs> He could sure say it about me. He could use that same excuse. Hey, if Dean hadn't messed up, I wouldn't have to forgive him. Well, problem is, I have messed up. So he says, I have to forgive like Christ did. That's a pretty high bar that nobody's going to get any better on. We cannot pray effectively when we are harboring a spirit of contention. And believe me, folks, a bad relationship with another believer will always hinder your prayer life. A man wants to say, Pastor, I have a fierce temper, but I suppose that's my cross. The pastor said, my friend, that's not your cross. That's your sin. Have you ever met somebody that, man, they're proud of their anger? Have you ever, you ever seen the guy that says, well, I just blow up and then it's okay? Yeah. Does the word or phrase collateral damage mean anything to you? They blow up and you get chunks of them all over you. Oh, I, I'm over it now. Yeah, thanks. Anger destroys unity. Anger breeds resentment is another thing it does. Resentment is the feeling of displeasure or indignation at some act, remark, or person. Somebody done somebody wrong song, right? And now I resent them and they've earned every bit of it, right? Amen? Job chapter 5 verse 2 says, Resentment kills a fool, and envy slays the simple. In anger breeds resentment, and unchecked resentment leads to bitterness. You're angry, it starts setting up shop, the devil gets a foothold, and the next thing you know, you are bitter. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Oswald Chambers says it like this, if there is even the tiniest grudge in your mind against anyone, your spiritual penetration into the knowledge of God stops. If you have bitterness, if I have bitterness towards someone else, it will absolutely stop my spiritual growth. 
That's tough. So if your prayers seem to be like they're bouncing off the ceiling, check your anger. Is there anger I need to deal with in my life? There's a good chance. That's a pretty common culprit. The second question you might ask in the troubleshooting guide is, is there an issue of unforgiveness toward a brother in Christ? I've gone from preaching to meddling now, haven't I? Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's still up there. Leave that up there. Wow. I want you to think about this. Is there someone, be honest, don't tell me who. Is there somebody you know good and well? Right, by reading that verse right there, the Holy Spirit just talked to you. He just put somebody's name, somebody's face in your brain, and he's telling you right now, have you forgiven that person? Every one of us can say, I have been there. Maybe you're not right, right now. I hope you're not. But I guarantee every one of us has been there. What about that last part? If you do not forgive that person whose name and face, if you do not forgive them their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. Wow. You want to know why your prayer's not working? Could be that. There's a book called Will Daylight Come by a guy named Richard Hoffler. He tells this great little story. Talks about forgiveness and how forgiveness is freeing. You know, at unforgiveness and, and how unforgiveness will enslave us. This little boy is visiting his grandparents. And they gave him a slingshot. And the little boy, he, he picked up some rocks. He's out there shooting everything he can find and targets and stuff. He wasn't a very good shot at it. Comes back towards the house and all of a sudden he sees grandma's duck. Her favorite duck. And what's he do? What's a little boy going to do, right? I'd have done it. You'd have done it too. You was a little boy. What's he do? He pulls that slingshot back, and as fate had it, he hit the duck, killed it. Scared to death. He grabs the duck, sticks it over behind the wood pile, only to walk around the wood pile, and there's his sister, Sally. She sees it. She doesn't say a word. That night, they're going to go out and do something, and... Uh, Grandma says, hey, I need Sally to stay here and help me do the dishes. And she says, oh, Johnny says he'll do the dishes. Remember the duck. <laughs> of course, Johnny volunteers to do the dishes. Next morning, Grandpa says, hey, Johnny and I are going to go fishing while Sally helps around the house. And Sally says, oh, wait, Johnny and I have worked it out. He wants to stay and help Grandma, so I'm going to go fishing with you. She looks at Johnny and says, remember the duck. This goes on for several days. Finally, little Johnny's had enough. He's, 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 he's grief-stricken anyway. He feels terrible, and he's become a victim of his sister. And so he goes to Grandma, and he confesses. He says, Grandma, I'm so sorry. I killed the duck. I didn't mean to. And she says, I know all about it. I saw it out the window. I forgave you immediately. I just didn't know how long you would let Sally keep you as a slave. Now, I want you to think about that name that's still in your head. I want you to think about that face that you're remembering during this sermon. The question is, how long are you going to let them live rent-free in your brain, in your heart? How long are you going to let them make you a slave? We've all done it. Believers should forgive others as God has forgiven them. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. An unforgiving spirit is totally, totally inconsistent with our position in Christ. In Ephesians 4, 2, it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. The spirit of unforgiveness will also bring God's punishment. Remember the story Jesus gave? I'm not going to read all this. You can skip that passage there, Bobby. But in Matthew chapter 18, you know, remember, uh, Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, how many times should I forgive my brother? He said, Up to seven times he was being generous with himself. What did Jesus say? No. <laughs> 
not seven times, but 70 times seven. And here for you math wizards, he's not saying get a calculator out when they hit 491, you can bust them. No. 70 times seven means just over and over and over with no limit. Okay. I know some of us thinking, hey, honey, you're getting pretty, you've been married any length of time? You're getting pretty close. Melody's way over that number with me, I'm sure. I mean, she, she should have killed me a long time ago. Thank God for that passage. But then Jesus goes on and gives this parable in the same passage. He said there was these two dudes that, you know, one guy owed this other guy a lot of money, and, and basically what he said he owed him was 10,000 talents. Now, we don't call money talents today, and it's not about a talent like being a painter or fisherman or anything else, thing like that. A talent was a, a measure of money. One talent equaled 20 years wages. Okay, so this guy owes this other guy literally uh, it's a lot, 10,000 talents. Based on what a, a day's wage or a year's wage would be, it comes out to like $3 billion, literally, $3.2 billion. It's insane how much this guy owed. So he goes to his master. His master said, hey, you got to pay me. I'm going to throw you in jail. And the guy says, oh, i got kids. i got all this going on. He said, can you give me a break? And the guy says, yes, I will forgive this debt. I mean, I don't know who could forgive $3.2 billion, you know, I mean, I know some people, I don't know them personally. There's some people in our, cult, in our country that have that kind of money. I doubt that they'd forgive it. Well, so what's the guy do? You remember the story? He goes out and finds another guy who owes him money. Well, the difference is, is the other guy just owed him, I think it's 100 denali. Okay, and you know what that meant? That was, that was basically, uh, yeah, 100 denali was four months' wages. So comparing an apple to apples, you know, one guy owes the other guy like, 3.2 billion, the poor guy, the Denali, is like $5,000. Okay, 3.2 billion, $5,000. Okay, that, that's an incredible difference. So, what's the second guy do? He grabs him by the throat and said, Pay it now, or I'm going to throw you in jail. The guy didn't have the money. He begs out, and the guy says, No way, you're going to jail. Well, some of the other people around, they saw the thing happen. They go back to the original master and they say, this jerk, you forgave him all this. And then he wouldn't even forgive this other guy this penny any amount. And what did the master do? He went back to the first guy and told him basically, because you were a jerk about this, because even though you were forgiven this incredible amount, you wouldn't do the same for somebody else. You owe me all of it. You owe me now. And you're going to jail until you pay it. How in the world would a guy go to jail and pay it back? You don't. What that meant is he was going to be incarcerated the rest of his life. Jesus is making the story there because, look, you and I are the ones who've been forgiven the $3.2 billion. And the one who's done something bad to us is, yeah, it's chump change. And God is saying, he's looking at this and saying, look, Dean, I have forgiven you all of this. How can you not forgive somebody who's done so much less than you've done? So if your prayer seems to be a waste of time, consider there may be some area of unforgiveness as the possible problem. Another question. Are there issues with a broken relationship? It's all kind of related here, but it's a little different. In Matthew 5, 23, it says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, which would have included prayer, and there remember that your brother has something against you, do what? Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. In 1 Peter chapter 3, he says it like this in verse 7, Husbands, do the same uh, in the same way. Be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. As and as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life. Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, there's two things he says here. And the first he says, hey, you're going to church. You're going to pray. You're going to sing. Whatever you're doing, you're giving an offering. And you remember that a brother. This is someone you've got a relationship with. I love how Malachi shared that. Communion. It's community. It's family. So here you've got a problem with another person you go to church with. Or maybe somebody in your actual family. And the second one is actually family for sure because it's your wife or your husband. What's he say? 
He said, if you've got this broken relationship with another church member or a family member, it can, in fact, hurt and hinder your prayers. Not easy. Conflicts, ha- conflicts are going to happen, right? If you've ever been in any kind of relationship at all, there is the potential for conflict. They're going to happen. But conflicts must be dealt with. And Jesus gives zero wiggle room. <laughs> Because in Matthew 5, he says, hey, you're given a gift, and you remember that your brother has something against you, which means you've done something, and now you remember that you did something wrong, you need to go make it right, okay? But we like to use the other side of that, well, I wasn't the one to do anything, I don't have, you know, I'm, hey, let them come to me. They did it, they started it, all right? How come we become children again? Because that's the way we act. But in Matthew 18, he eliminates the wiggle room. (laughs) If your brother sins against you... Okay, the first one, you've done something against them. This one, you're the one who done wrong, right? If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen then, take it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. Either way. You're given your offering, and you remember that you did some. You're supposed to go try to make it right. The other side of it is if you remember that you did something or he did something. Either way, something's been done wrong, and you're part of it. It is our responsibility as best we can to make it right. Some of us fear conflict. I get it. Someone said, like the grass in the African proverb, when bull elephants fight, the grass always loses. I think some people are just terrified to reach out. You know, oh, I know they did something wrong. I know I should probably, you know, confront them, but I'm afraid to. You know, we dread conflict sometimes, like, you know, we're afraid we're going to open this can of worms, have no idea how to get them back in. That's a legitimate fear, but the Bible still says we need to try to deal with conflict. That's what it says about doing it in love and patience and kindness. And, you know, there's all kinds of good examples of how to do it and good recommendations of how to do it. We just need to do it. Before God will answer our prayers, we must settle our difference with others. If we don't, we're being hypocrites for asking for forgiveness without being willing to offer it. And we should try to settle conflicts whether we're responsible or not. We're part of the mix. Regardless of who is the fault of the broken relationship, we need to make the effort to reconcile before we go worship God. Folks, here's the deal. True worship is not enhanced by better music, better preaching. It is enhanced by better relationships between those who worship. It's the right relationship with God that makes it rich, and it's the right relationship with those people around you as you do it together that makes it rich. If your prey station isn't working, check the connections. Could be the connection between you and God. Could be the connection with somebody else, but it's probably very possibly a connection. And one more I want to talk about briefly. Are there issues of indifference to those in need? In James chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Suppose a brother or sister was out clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it this time of year i get it you are hammered (laughs) on every turn there's somebody wanting money somebody wanting to to help somebody and and we need to be generous and helpful and i think we need to pray about it and and decide where god wants us to use it but there's some times when we're just selfish and when we see people in need and we know we could help and we're not That can hinder our prayer. Because God is about helping people. He really is. We've got, I I, I don't want to start naming names here because I'd forget somebody. We've got some rock star servants in our church. We really do. People that just regularly look for opportunities to serve other people. And we give opportunities regularly to serve. You know, there's a couple out there now. We're going to have Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, we want people to cook stuff and bring stuff. But you know what's there no opportunity for you? Bring a friend. 
We had a sign up. We've got, we, you know, periodically we serve at the food bank downtown. We always announce that there's an opportunity for you if you, if you got the time to go down there. And, you know, you don't have to buy the food. You just go down there and help people with some paperwork and bag it up. We got some wonderful people here that have a servant's heart, and we appreciate them. But if this is something you're struggling with, and you find yourself just pushing back every time there's an opportunity to do something outside of yourself, that heart problem could lead to a prayer problem. Someone wrote the book, Caring is Dangerous, or about the, the, that caring is in danger. Elton Trueblood, in, his, in the book, was The Yoke of Christ. He wrote this, he said, there was a schoolgirl who probed the depth of, her, depth of her soul, and she wrote, I've been thinking much this year about the importance of caring, of the passion of life. I've often realized that it takes courage to care. Caring is dangerous. It leaves you open to hurt and to looking like a fool. And perhaps it's because you have been hurt that so often people are afraid to care. You can't die if you're not alive. And then who would rather be a stone? I have found many places in my own life where I keep a secret store of indifference as a sort of self-protection. He writes, that's a penetrating insight. A secret store of indifference. Folks, we are to care because Christ cared, even though it meant a cross. I've said this before, and I mean it, and I've experienced it. Evangelism is a dirty business. And I want to challenge you with this, because there's people that you know. There's people in your family, maybe in your community, that you interact with, and you know good and well. You look at that situation, and it's nothing but a train wreck. And it's like, oh my gosh, how much more crazy could this family be, this situation, this environment? And you know there's something maybe you could do to help, and you risk, you don't want to risk it. Now, what I mean by evangelism is a dirty business. If I build a relationship with somebody, and their family is a train wreck, and they wind up coming to church, and they wind up accepting Jesus, what happens? I just got sucked into the train wreck. (laughs) Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Jesus was criticized. Why? Because he dined with publicans and sinners. What kind of heat do you think Jesus got when he's walking down the road and he sees this little short guy up a sycamore tree and he says, Zacchaeus, you dirty, filthy tax collector which is what everybody would have thought. Because Zacchaeus was a Jew who was making money by being a tax collector for the Romans. And when they came to collect tax, they would come with a soldier. And if he wanted to take a little extra, that was just fine as long as Rome got theirs. You talk about a traitor to his country. He would have been hated, probably more than the Romans were hated. Jesus knew what a train wreck that would be. And what did he do? Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house today. He gets Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. What's Matthew do? He throws a party. What kind of people would have come to Matthew's party? The Pharisees weren't coming. The Sadducees weren't coming. His share wrote, gypsies, tramps, and thieves, probably. What kind of a nightmare was that? a nightmare for some, but it was a dream for Jesus. Jesus, he hurt because he cared so much. I mean, the picture of the prodigal son, that's him. I mean, it's, if you you can put your mind into, into that father's head, Yeah, he wants his son to come home, but when he sees him, what does he see? I mean, the Scripture tells us what kind of life that boy lived. He's out of money. It says he lived his life on riotous living. The Scripture sanitizes that pretty good. He's out there partying with who knows what. 
What if that was today? What kind of cultural picture would that be today? And here that father remembers his son leaving. He's tall. He's proud. He's wealthy. Probably very well educated. That's not who comes back. And yet, what is the father doing while he's gone? He's looking for him. I see him sitting on the front porch, and every day he sits on the front porch. He's got a cup of coffee, and he's looking down the road. And he's praying, dear God, let it be today he comes home. What do you think he looked like when he came home? What do you think he smelled like? Successful Jewish boy smells like pigs. Look like death warmed over. I have to think that dad, he sees his son. There's a part of him crying in joy, but there's a part of him crying because that can't be my son. That can't be my son. And yet it is. You and I need to start praying and saying, God, help me see your lost sons and your daughters like you do. Help me see him like it was one of my own. And when you do that, I guarantee your prayers, <laughs> they're going to be ratcheted up. <laughs> and you're going to find out evangelism can be a dirty business. But I can also tell you, it can be the best business. There is nothing more rewarding than to see somebody's kid come home and you get to celebrate with it. How's your prayer life? <laughs> we need to possess can't, that compassion without being phony. We cannot overlook the welfare of those in need. Proverbs 21, 13 says, If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. 1 John three seventeen says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? If you're determined that there is nothing that should keep be keeping God from answering your prayers, then pray with faith. Believing that God will do the right thing even if we don't understand I put this illustration in my sermon the other day, and uh, I really wrestled with it. I didn't even read it. Because right now it's way, way too close to some people here. I'm at the team come. This is a story of a guy named Gerald Sitzer. It was September 17th, or I'm sorry, September 27, 1991. He was a praying man, and every day he'd pray for his family. He was a professor of religion and philosophy at Whitworth College. And he prayed every day, asking God to protect and bless his family. He writes that something went terribly wrong that day. Later that afternoon, returning from a family outing, a drunk driver lost control and smashed into their minivan. It killed his wife, Linda, his daughter, Diana Jane, and his mother, who was visiting with them for the weekend. All of them killed in that one accident. And he wrote later, To this day, I have been unable to understand what made that day different. What prevented my prayers from getting through to God? Did I commit some unpardonable sin? Did I fail to say the right words? Did God suddenly turn against me? Why, I've asked myself a thousand times, did my prayer go unanswered, the prayer to protect his family? He still could not explain it, but he concluded it in an article on unanswered prayer that he wrote later. He said, Jesus changes or I'm sorry, charges us to view life from a redemptive perspective. There's more to life than meets the eye when God gets involved. He works things out for good. We view unanswered prayer from the perspective of our immediate experience and our, li and our limited vision. But God is doing something so great that only faith can grasp it. Wait for that and pray for that. We've got some folks that I dearly love. They're going through it. Many of you have gone through it. 
Many of you have prayed for loved ones that God decided in his perfect wisdom not to heal, but to protect, perfect. That's not easy for us to grasp. But when the connections are right, we can. And our prayers can be incredibly powerful then. Romans 8.28 is as true now as it was 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote it. All things work to the good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. We are called. He's got a purpose. Our prayer doesn't necessarily change God. It will flat out change us. God doesn't need to change. <laughs> In case you're curious about that. I sure know I do. Father, we love you. Thank you for your truth. Help us to not just be hearers today, but doers. If anything we talked about today is your spirit has brought that to our attention. Help us to deal with it. Maybe we need to come and pray about it. Maybe we need to deal with it where we're at. Maybe we need to go across the room and talk to somebody. But Lord, draw us to you. Help us to be people of prayer, not just lip service, but real communication with you. Thank you, Lord, that we can do this. Give us a desire that will not stop until we get it right. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me right now? All God's people said, amen. The music was, <laughs> there's an incredible message in the music today. Just take that to heart. Let us be that generation, the generation that seeks him. Uh, keep praying for each other. Pay attention. If you don't get our prayer chain, maybe fill that out on the card. We'll get like the, we've got 60, 70 people to get that, but there's some pretty serious health issues going on, some other issues going on that, that we do share. Uh, 
pray for each other. There's just a lot going on with people that we all love. So thank you all for being here. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I realize walking in front of a whole bunch of people you don't know is terrifying. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you can wait till church is over and come find me, find one of these guys. We'd love some of these ladies. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, don't forget, we've got some sign-ups out there, a lot of good stuff going. Next week, as Carl said, is bring the boxes back next week, all right? God bless you guys. You all have a great day. And again, thank you to our veterans.